So today we're going to talk about the IoT app. I'm going to show you um, how an IoT app finds its way to the cloud, basically. We'll show how the same app runs at localhost, then we move it to PCF dev, then finally the full-blown Pivotal Cloud Foundry. We'll show some differences uh, for each of these stages, and we'll also highlight some of the problem we ran into as we move, move the app to the cloud, basically. All right, so we've seen lots of hype around IoT. Um, so in the given study, as you've seen on the bottom of the screen, in this year, IDC and Garner shows that there have been over $800 million in spending related to IoT. Then there are basically over 8 billion connected things just this year. But these numbers will greatly increase. So by the, the end of the year 2021, we will have over $1.4 trillion spending on IoT, as well as uh, over 20 billion connected things. And of course, that poses a lot of challenges as well as opportunities. Okay, so here we have a, we, connect, we basically we work with our partners and set up some labs, and this is the architecture of the lab we, we, we built for also the, the lab environment behind the app I'm gonna show you. So on the bottom, we, we see that there are three labs, but we are adding more labs as well. Each lab is focusing on different scenarios. So the first one, demo app, on the bottom left, that's this one. So that's for abandoned device. And the second one, we call lab one room. So that's for basically drone detection. So think of a, of a surveillance ad, um, scenario where there's a drone flying, trying to prey information, and we, we use AI to detect that. So that's, that's the plan. And the third one, that's uh, highlighting the chemical pollution scenario. Uh, we are also add, adding several other labs, which is which now showing the architecture. On the Top, in the middle section, that's uh, the center of uh, our environment. So we have a data center, and it's built on top of uh, Dell IoT Gateway. And we also have a uh, Dell PowerEdge server created in arrays. So such uh, hardware is set up in such a way that all these uh, lab, uh, you know, each lab has like uh, over a dozen sensors, so each sensor is emitting at least a record a second. So all these lab, all these data collected from these labs uh, using you know, the standard MQTT protocol as well as the other protocol to feed into this um, hardware environment. We also set up um, uh, virtual, you know, virtual on top. So that's uh, on top of the virtual layer, we have a Hadoop for um, in batch processing, including some of the Hadoop ecosystem tools. We also have, um, um, you know, you see the NAS cameras, you, know, so you could see the video feed coming in, and the same, same video feed is also ingested into an off, offshore store. We also have a MongoDB, so that's the heart of this demo I'm gonna show later for the data store part. Then on top of that, we have uh, two destinations showing in the picture. So on the left, that's the on-prem environment, you know, Native hybrid cloud, that's a solution we, pr we built for our customers for you know, on-prem management um, in, in cloud native environment. On the top right, that's uh, the public service in Pivotal Cloud Foundry in Pivotal Web Services. Then on the top left, we also support some of the public cloud services uh, in, depending on the use case we build. So we use uh, Microsoft Azure for the POC. Um, so one of the, in, one of the demo we built is uh, to uh, you know, build a you know, basically a customer 360 profile you know, with the license detection. So when imagining a bank you know, scenario, when, when the customer walks into the parking lot, um, the, such video feed is picked up by the surveillance camera and analyze the, the, basically the license plate and that license plate is uh, associated with the banking customer. Then we, we could quickly and recognize the high profile customer, then you know, by the time he walks into the door, we will show them the different promotion depending on his uh, uh, history with the bank. So that's the, basically the environment. All right, so our, to start, so our data scientists have uh, created this app, 
originally. It's um, running on R environment, and it uses the Shining R, which is a very popular visualization dashboard in, in R environment. And such a dashboard is uh, running basically um, on his uh, laptop. Then eventually he pushed, uh, he, he made this app, you know, running on Shiny uh, web, as well as uh, um, also the near the edge, but still it's a uh, monolithic architecture. The, the service is still, you know, basically just um, some CSV file he, he put in to analyze the data. He, he, did, he changed it later into MongoDB, but still, you know, it, it has a uh, lot of the issues as, um, a monolithic application architecture, like uh, it's slow to load and uh, also difficult to manage. So originally our plan was to use a customized R build pad to push this app to Pillow Cloud Foundry. Um, there are many R build packs you could find um, on GitHub. We, we use this, this uh, build pad show on the screen and you can go to this link to check it out. But um, I'll show some problem as well as the benefits of using the customized build pad in the next slide. So first of all, um, some of the, these are some of the benefits in using customized R build path. In not necessarily just R, but in general, the customized build path, you know, they are you know, basically they, they designed for containers. So you could easily you know, move apps to, to the Cloud Foundry, Foundry environment. Um, it's uh, friendly to R users. So you know, a lot of uh, data science, at least half of the data scientists uses R for programming and you know, data analytics. So it's very friendly to them. They, they don't need to talk to the developers. They could just figure out how to push the app to the Cloud Foundry themselves. And finally, you know, for the build pack, they, since they designed, like the build pack I showed previously, it's designed for container, not just for Cloud Foundry, but also for Heroku. So the apps, the chances that these data science apps could run in both environments. But that being said, there are a lot of challenges using customized R build pad as well. So first of all, there are a lot of version compatibility issues. So certain, certain libraries don't work together and it's a difficult to figure out for, for the end user as, until they push the apps to, to the cloud. Then there, there will be lots of, lots of difficulties to move move that and change the version compatibility, you know, um, different versions. It's just a headache. A second one, that's a, even a bigger one, you know, the extended staging time. So by default, I think the Cloud Foundry uh, staging is only 15 minutes. But when you use a build pack, like a, a customized R build pack, you know, the installation of the base R package, installation of all the R um, dependency libraries, all including the staging time. So chances are most of the time you will exceed this um, staging time threshold, 15 minutes. You, of course you could do the export in the CF or staging um, timeout as, as well as the startup timeout, but it's just a pain they have to remember doing that. And the third one, it will result in a very bulky app, you know, because um, when even a simple R dashboard app, you will have to install the R package as well as all the dependency libraries. Even you only use uh, like a, a few lines from a dependency library, you still have to install the whole thing. And some of the dependency libraries are pretty big. So a lot of times we found out when after we finish out staging the app, the droplet is like over one gig. Um, so it's um, just like bulky. Then lastly, for certain technologies, it doesn't, come, it doesn't work with Cloud Foundry. So one example is the, the JDK. So Cloud Foundry, it doesn't support open JDK, period. You could work with um, JRE with Cloud Foundry, but JDK is no go. Um, second of all, we found another problem is that with this uh, OpenMP, which is an uh, open source massive parallel processing paradigm that developer could use to run process it parallelly. But I think it's because the uh, Cloud Foundry natively, you could use the CF scale to you know, parallelize your apps. So they, probably because of that, Cloud Foundry disabled OpenMP. So if your our apps using, uses the uh, OpenMP as well as the, the libraries, even the dependency of your libraries uses uh, OpenMP, you will get the error when you do the CF push. It's saying something like OpenLT, uh, the container doesn't work with the OpenMP. 
And we, we show that some of these library, you know, that basically use either the JDK as well as the um, OpenMP technologies. And you could see some of them are very popular R libraries, like this uh, R Java on the top. Uh, Mallet is a very popular machine learning libraries. Um, then R Mongo, so basically that's the go-to library if you want to access MongoDB with the R. Yeah, and um, on the bottom, Markov chain, that's also a very popular library uh, for, the, for building Markov chain you know, for machine learning. So basically, you know, because of these reasons, we decided okay, we're not gonna do the customized R build path, at least not at the production level. All right, so another direction is uh, keep, you know, stick with the uh, official CF build path. In this example app I'm gonna show, it uses the Python build path, and it works with uh, Python 2. You could change it to Python 3 easily. It also, you know, it run, we run it on local host as a starting point, then test it in PCF dev, then finally push it to the on-prem PCF or public, the Pivotal web services. All right, so the, in the first scenario, running on local host, um, you can see down the top, uh, we use the language Python 2, so you can also do Anaconda Python 2, either one's fine. If you, if you want to change to Python 3, you have to create a runtime.txt in your app directory, then point, point it to Python 3 so, so that the build pad knows which version of Python to use. Then secondly, um, you could do the, you create this re requirements.txt to explicitly list which libraries as well as the version you want. And this is a highly recommended as, as long as your app is handed by one, over one person. <laughs> then the, you know, there's no endpoint logging. Then dependency, you know, basically we, um, I use the, Anaconda virtual environment. You could also use the, just the virtual M for you know, the con version control as well as the is in different, con different virtual environment for Python. Mm. And they also use the local Redis service for some of the caching so you don't keep curing the your MongoDB database. Then the star command, I use the Bokeh. It's a very popular Python visualization Library, it could run the both as a, you know a just like snippet, it produce a image, or you could run it in, entirely as a bouquet server. Then finally, the app URL is the local host. Then second, in in the PCF dev, we switch to the Python build pad, and you can see that you know Python building build pad will handle all the dependency li libraries as long as you define the requirements.txt file. Um, it's very easy to, to do the CF push. For the endpoint, you know, you, you do the typical CF log into the local PCF dev instance. Then when you, when you do the dependency, you have to create a service. So first of all, you gotta make sure the Redis service is included. If you just go with the default PCF dev, chances are that this P Redis is included in your in your instance. So you could just uh, do a CF create service, P Redis, to, to create this uh, service instance. We call it IoT underscore Redis. That's uh, this part. Then the difference, one difference is in the proc file. You, you have defined proc file for PCF dev as well as the PCF. This is uh, the file that you, basically you list the starting command so that your, when, when your app gets pushed, PCF or PCF dev knows which, uh, which command to run. So in this uh, proc file, we, since we use Bokeh, we just use this uh, Bokeh command to start the server. And you can see that there's some difference. So um, you know, in the local host scenario, you give um, port A0, A0. And this part, you could change it to is, uh, you could keep it A0, A0, or you could just use the dollar port. Then this one, the allow web socket origin. This is an important part. So I pointed to the, the final URL this app's gonna run. You could do, you know, technically you could switch this to just a wildcard, just a star. But that will pose a security leak. 
Um, so when you run a web app, whenever you want to update data and update your application, you will use the WebSocket to update that. Then if, we, if you allow WebSocket connection from any URL, then it, your application will post to basically the denial of service attack. So I, because of this reason, I highly recommend you to explicitly list the URL in the WebSocket origin URL in, for your app. Then the address list, like whatever address uh, you want your app to, to run on, to listen. Um, so I give 0000, zero, zero, zero so that means that any address this container runs, will you know, we'll use that IP for, for the listening request. Yeah, so that's uh, pretty much it for the, for the second one. Then the third one is the pivotal web service. The major difference here um, is the, the port. You could see that I use this port um, over here, it's so 4443. That's because um, Pivotal Web Service changed the default WebSocket top, um, port, which is a 443. They changed it to 4443. So if you, you don't explicitly list the 4443 port, then your app won't basically won't work. It, it won't update data, and et cetera. Another, part, another difference is that um, for Pivotal Web Service, it uses a, a the Redis cloud as the plan name for Redis. So you have to change uh, from P Redis to Redis cloud. You have to also provide a plan detail. So in this case, the, I go with the free tier 30 megabytes. Yeah, so those are the basically the two major differences. Another thing is that because I listed the web, web socket to 4443, you have to, you have to access the app at 4443 as well. All right, so with that said, I'm gonna show you a demo. Hello, sorry, I have to stand a little taller. <laughs> yeah, so here I, I have all my app here listed. This is the, direct, the directory of for my app local for, for app one. Can you see the screen well, by the way, from, especially from back? Okay, great. Yeah, so first of all, I'm gonna go with this command So um, I want to show you the one thing before I start the server. So you have to give, give this uh, environment variable. You basically just set up some system environment variable. So this is the Windows version I put in BAT. And the Linux version is uh, S port. So you have to you know, set these uh, variable up to tell the app which MongoDB instance to connect. Um, yeah, so then in, inside your application, you access these variables names to, to get the data. So that's uh, the local host scenario. All right, so I'm gonna execute this command. So now you see this app is uh, running on local host. Then here, let, let me go to the demo gateway. And you see these are all the devices available in the demo room. And you can also go to this nest to see what's really there. So, so this is the demo room. Um, so let's uh, see, for example, I go to this, um, this is another app we built for just on the, the edge side. Then so that you know, we, we could allow low latency. So let's say if I go to the palette, it's factory palette, so in the video you could see it's right here. Right now it's off. Now let's say if I go to the same palette in my app locally, then I choose control bits. I'm gonna increase, let's say, 17 minutes. So right now it sees a zero because it's off. You can also see here, this, this is the app on the edge side. The, let's say I change it to green. See, there's some latency, but you see the palette turns on screen right now. All right, I'll give it a few seconds so that my app could pick it up. So the, in this app, I 
update every 15 seconds, there's a little latency. I, I intentionally did 15 seconds so we don't update the app, app you know, access the database too frequently. Imagine, you know, imagine that this app's gonna stay in the cloud, you know, away from the edge. So there will be a, some latency issue. So we don't want to, to we don't want it to update too frequently. But you see that after a few seconds, it pick up the you know, control base is now at four. And this is the same number here, color number four. Now let's uh, go change it to red. You see now it becomes red. And after a few seconds, this app will pick up as well. Um, the red color is, by the way, is um, one. So the number will change to one after a few seconds. And this is the bouquet um, library for, you know, I use for visualization. So it, it includes the, all the functionality of bouquet. And for example, I could do the wheel zoom. I could pan it. Then let's say if, uh, I'm, if I'm fine you know, with this, uh, I could just save it so that it saves into a static image that I could view later, I'll share with uh, my colleagues. Yeah, so basically, you see this app is now picked up. All right, so that's, uh, that's localhost. Now let's uh, take a look at um, what's, uh, what's for the PC app dev. I'm just gonna play a video because um, it takes a long time to start the um, PC app dev virtual box image. So first of all, you, you see this, uh, I target the local PC adapt logging as a user pass to the default org and space. Then I go to the CF marketplace. So you see right now, um, we have the P Redis on the bottom of the list in the marketplace. So I create a service, P Redis, and I call it IOT underscore Redis. So you see now the service gets created. Then I go to in my app directory. I have a requirements dot test list the, the dependencies. I have manifest that YAML as well as the app directory. And this is the content of the manifest YAML. Of course, I, I hid the login credentials and such. Um, but once you replace them with the real credential, then you could you know, do the CF push. This is the proc file. So as I mentioned, you, you, could, you, could do it, um, on this, you could do the dollar port. And this is the host WebSocket, and this is the address the app's gonna listen for requests. So after this is all done, um, we, we could take a look at the requirement.test and then do the CF push. Okay, so Finally, we, we do just do a simple CF push because we have the manifest. All right, so we will call it IoT app one. Then it will you know basically create the container, run through the entire you know building the app and pushing the app. Now this stage is to basically install the all the dependency are listed in the requirements.txt. Yeah, so this part also install all the dependency library of my dependency libraries. Then eventually I upload the droplet. So now my app is running in the cloud. So I could log go to my web GUI to log in as admin admin and check my app status as well as running the app. So this is the same app. I'm not gonna show the rest, um, just save some time. So finally, um, I'm gonna show how we run the, how we push the app to Pivotal Web Service. So I'm in my app two. So this is a fancier app. So I used, I took the original app one. Now I add some CSS style as, I, as well as the JavaScript libraries. Then I, let's take a look at the manifest. 
So this is the manifest for app two. It's very similar to what you've seen previously for PCF dev scenario. So okay, so the in my directory, I first of, first of all I make sure I'm targeting the right instance. So you see I'm targeting the Pivotal web service endpoint. Now let's um, basically do a simple CF push because I already update my manifest, make sure it works as well as the requirements.txt. So let's do a CF push. Okay, see now we are creating a, this app IoT app two, app four 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 three, that's the name. But the final app is gonna run at IoT app two dot CF apps dot IO at this URL. You see, this is uh, very similar to PC app in, as in terms of for pushing the app. A little difference is that you see the, the build pack is basically accessing the, some temporary directory for getting some of the base packages. So now that's the, requ in the requirements text. That's a dependency library. You see it installs a lot of more libraries because a lot of them are defined as dependency for my dependency library. So it goes to all the iterations. Now it's uploading droplet. Yeah, it's now starting the app. And finally it's running. So I could do the CF apps, make sure it's uh, listening. So you see that now this app is started. And you could go to this URL I, I mentioned earlier. Make sure to add the 4443 port number. And it's uh, at HTTPS. So now it's the app too, with some styles. And you could go to, for example, let's say demo lab. I'm gonna go to the motor and change it to, you know, check the RPM. So right now you see this is the, the motor RPM. So it's from zero, now it's 500. Yep. So let's go to the same one, that's the, this motor. Dem demo room, motor. So you see it's running. Um, and let's say right now it's 500, I'm changing to 250. And let's see what happens. So you see now it's the speed gradually will decrease. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, this is a, um, the customer 360 app I mentioned earlier. So I'm gonna, not gonna show the detail, but basically we, we, we mimic this uh, scenario as a customer walking into the bank and then immediately such information like license plate is picked up by the bank to highlight who he is and also what, what his spending habit is so, so we, they could do the target marketing. All right, so here are some of the next steps at um, my company. So first of all, we'll extend the IoT use cases. We also creating deep learning use cases. You know, we are, one thing we work is uh, create this uh, GPU as a service for Pillow Cloud Foundry. Um, then we also work working on the edge computes. Uh, come back, you know, at uh, tomorrow. I think well, my colleague Barton George has a talk on edge egg foundry. So he, you will learn what we have done and what we what's planning on the roadmap. And then finally, of course, we're gonna design the next gen IoT solution. In fact, yesterday Michael Dell announced that at Dell, you know, we will spend um, one billion dollars for the next three years just for. Um, IoT investment. All right, and yeah, you could 
come talk to me you know, after the, the session. I, I don't think we have time for, for FAQ, but make sure to talk to me when you have like, any questions. Thank you.